Okay, uh, as you just saw, Bo Simonson has been a professional polyglot programmer since 1998. He's a technical product manager for Blackfire and he's co-host of uh, that podcast. How he learned to stop wiring and love auto-wiring containers. Bo, it's your time. Thank you, everyone. Um, so yeah, today we're going to talk about auto-wiring containers. How many of the people in the audience here have used auto-wiring containers? Just a small handful. How many don't use them because they hate the idea of auto-wiring containers? Okay, good. This audience isn't going to be too critical, hopefully. Um, to start out with, we're going to talk about some terminology and some concepts. I'm going to talk about some of the history that I've had with auto-wiring containers throughout the years. And then we're going to take a look at some implementations. So to start out with, we're going to talk about solid. It's not going to be a talk on solid, uh, but a talk about how I think a lot of people, if you don't really know like me, um, get the D mixed up. Um, I always think sol uh, the D in solid is dependency injection. Um, that's not actually the case. Uh, the D in solid is actually dependency inversion. So even though they sound sort of similar, they're slightly different. Uh, dependency inversion is all about making sure that objects don't depend on specific implementations. Another idea is inversion of control. Uh, inversion of control is, you know, shares the I from dependency inversion, uh, but it's about how objects are actually created. Um, so this is how things are actually uh, bound together at one time. And there's two implementations that people generally will use for dependency, uh, for inversion of control. Uh, one is dependency injection. So here again, we see dependency injection sort of related to these different ideas of inversion of control. Um, it's actually an implementation of inversion of control. Um, and the main idea behind it is to pass the objects, the things they're going to collaborate with, rather than having the object itself generate those objects. Another implementation of inversion of control is service locator. Uh, this one sort of gets a bad name every once in a while, but in some cases, this is actually the best solution. Um, service locator um, is still inverting the control of getting or creating the object that you're looking for. It's just that you're explicitly asking for that instead of being passed. So if we look at all these names and how they sort of relate together, uh, dependency inversion is its own thing. Um, inversion of control uh, still has the inversion name in there somewhere. Um, and then we have dependency injection. So now we have you know, dependency and we have inversion and dependency injection and then service locator. Most of the time, people are going to create a container around these things. So you might hear somebody uh, talking about their dependency injection container. Uh, they, might have an invert they might say they have an inversion of control container, or they might have a service container. These are all pretty common names that people will use for these. Um, and, and the short word that people used to use quite often was just container. Um, you know, I would say even three or four years ago, if you talked about your, op your application's container, you were probably talking about your um, dependency injection container or your service locator. These days, though, uh, if you say container, especially coming to a conference, everyone's like, oh, you're talking about Docker. No, those, 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 are, those are different containers. So um, the container name itself um, is kind of overloaded these days. So sometimes it can be a little confusing talking about these things. Something in common uh, with all of the dependency injection containers is usually this concept of wiring. And what wiring is is the explicit way that you map your objects together. So an example of a Symfony application with a container, um, container wiring, you see these services with names like app.wordlist. Uh, you specify what class that service is supposed to be using, and then you can specify some of the arguments in order to be able to create that object. Um, and when you start looking at things like app.gamerunner, uh, you're seeing that you're defining a class whose arguments are actually other services. So here we see a uh, reference to app.gamecontext and then an optional reference to app.wordlist. So this is the idea of wiring these objects together so they know how to work. So uh, for a little bit of backstory, my, my first experience with um, auto wiring and uh, containers was Spring Framework's IOC container. Has anyone ever worked with Spring's container before? Okay, a couple of people, awesome. Um, they had this idea um, of things called beans. And it was kind of a confusing name because um, Spring is a, a Java framework. And Java already had a notion of beans. Um, so it was really confusing me, for me for a long time. I didn't understand what these beans were and how they interacted with Spring and why they had to have this weird 
uh, XML file. Uh, but what Beans were, uh, in the context of uh, Spring's IOC container, it was just a service. It was an object, some sort of object that had some sort of dependencies that could then be passed to other objects. The way that I used it was with explicit wiring. So I was creating a file like I showed earlier where you specify all of the services, you specify the class, and you specify how they relate to each other. Um, I preferred the XML um, style over annotations uh, just because I have this um, sort of not really very well-founded belief that annotations are evil. And I didn't really like them or, or get them. And I wanted the code separate from the wiring. I've sort of been a little more lax on that these days. Uh, the way that uh, Spring's XML file looked is you had the uh, container object that was beans, and then you would have a bean uh, that had an ID, a class, and then some of the arguments that we passed to it. So it was very similar to the other style that we looked at first, it's just that it's in an XML format instead of a YAML format. The next dependency injection component that I, I heard of was Google's Juice. Has anyone used Juice? No, okay. Uh, Google's Juice is actually uh, it's a Python um, dependency injection framework. And it was all based, as far as I could understand at the time, on uh, explicit code definition. So within the application yourself, itself, uh, you would define in the code using this little inject thing. It sort of looks like, um, uh, it sort of looks like an annotation uh, that would tell the application that we needed to inject some of the dependencies. Um, so then later you could say, okay, well, I want to create an injector for the billing module, and then I want to get an instance of the uh, billing service class. And it would figure out based on how it had been type hinted in the code and uh, annotated with the inject to figure out what it needed to make that object. And looking at this, I just kind of shook my head, and I was like, mm, this doesn't make sense. I mean, you can have multiple instances of the same object. You could have multiple implementations of the same interface. Um, you know, the, it just didn't seem like it would work very well. Um, and uh, a friend of mine at the time who was working with this quite a bit said, well, that hardly ever happens. It, if it does, we can get, we get around it. There's ways to get around it, but it's usually not very, um, not, not, not a big problem. Um, and I didn't listen to him at the time because I was like, whatever, this is just a really silly idea. Um, but you know, for the record, it actually turns out that he probably was right based on uh, the experience that I've had since then. So we're going to go back to UPHP um, and look at um, this inversion of control dependency injection concept within PHP. Um, I worked in Spring for about a year and a half, really liked it. This was back in 2008, so this was well before Composer. Um, and I wanted to see what I could do um, in PHP that was sort of similar. Um, at the time, I was working by myself. Um, I didn't really talk to anybody else. I didn't use anybody else's code. I was just working in my own little silos. Uh, so I started working on a project called Substrate uh, that was uh, intended to be an inversion of control container for PHP. And instead of beans, I used stones because stones went with the name. And I hadn't learned the lesson <laughs> from my own experience being confused about what beans are uh, that I just decided to copy that and named it something completely arbitrary. Um, I also focused on explicit wiring because that was what I was familiar with. Um, and I did it all with PHP. Um, so it's the same sort of thing that you would, would have done with um, a YAML file or an XML file, but you're just specifying it uh, directly within um, a configuration file. And it turned out that I was actually doing some auto wiring. I didn't realize it at the time. When I had seen auto wiring brought up in Spring Framework, I had no idea what it was talking about. Uh, but when I implemented uh, my application, I sort of um, or my own uh, framework, I sort of accidentally created the same concept. Uh, the idea was that when uh, at runtime you ask for one of these services or stones to be instantiated, it would look at the constructor arguments that were on the constructor, and then it would look through all of the other objects to see if any of the objects already defined implemented the, um, implemented the class that the constructor was wanting. Um, and if it was, it would get that then from the container. So this was a, a primitive form of auto wiring that was very, very simple. Um, so if we wanted to look at an example, if we had a file logger, um, it needs a file name. So we're using dependency injection here. Uh, we're going to do um, a log factory that uh, you create the log factory with the logger. It's a pretty contrived example, but if you can uh, imagine that this makes sense, 
Um, and then we're going to add to the container, this virtual container, um, a DD uh, logging file logger and give it the constructor arm for, arg for the file name. And then we're going to create a log factory, and all we're going to specify is the class name. So when we ask for the, the log factory, it's going to look to say, oh, I need a file logger, because that's what the object needs in its constructor arg. So then it looks to see, oh, hey, this logger that's been defined implements this interface, so I'm going to inject it for you. Didn't take me long to realize that this was a waste of time to try and build this myself. Um, I ended up finding out that there's this massive Symphony community that had slowly migrated from Symphony 1 to Symphony 2. Um, and it turned out that uh, the Symphony 2 sy system seemed to be largely inspired by the Spring framework. So uh, I felt pretty at home. Uh, specifically, I liked the Symphony dependency injection component. Um, it seemed quite flexible. Uh, one of the big things it had that I liked was this compiler pass idea that let you do some additional things to the container as it was being built. Um, and the compiler part of the name means that it was compiled. Um, anything that I'd done in PHP to that point had been um, at runtime, so a lot of reflection stuff. And this compiled container means that it was actually going to be you know, really good on performance. Uh, you could test things uh, in its entirety without having to accidentally run into weird conditions at runtime that you hadn't um, tested yet or hadn't run into before. So I was really excited about uh, Spring's framework. And so just to walk through um, how, um, uh, to walk through some implementations of dependency injection and kind of how I develop code and how they sort of relate, uh, we're gonna look at a file called k.php. Um, sometimes this is K2, K3, sometimes it's L, whatever. It's, just, it's basically a scratch space that I use to build up uh, my implementations before I actually bother to, to create different files. So inside KPHP, I'm going to create a service called some important service that's going to use our hypothetical logger factory that we had before. It's going to have um, a function on it called do important task that is simply going to uh, send an info log message for did important task. So that's all it's going to do. So we're already set up for dependency injection here uh, because we're uh, consuming our only collaborator from the constructor. Uh, so we're not doing service locator or anything along those lines. So what my file looks like is an inline file that has the class defined at the top. And then I'm going to start implement, um, I'm going to start uh, instantiating the dependencies. So this is manual explicit wiring of, of objects. This is the traditional way that people would write PHP. Uh, so you create the logger, you create the logger factory, pass the logger factory to the important service, and then you can do the important task. So this is, this is what you would do by hand. Um, if you're using something like uh, Spring, uh, sorry, something like Symphony's container using the YAML format, um, you would specify these things as, instead of like dollar sign file logger and dollar sign logger factory, you just give it the name uh, within the container, and then you can ask for those objects out by those names. Uh, so here we have file logger, logger factory, important service. Uh, the little at with the service name is a way to say uh, reference that object. So uh, logger factory argument is at file logger. That means go get the service defined by file logger, create it, and then pass it to me. So the way you use this then uh, would be to uh, either have it passed to you by dependency injection, um, or you could actually go to the container and get that object directly. So here we're getting important service, and then we can do the important task. Um, Symphony also supports XML, uh, so it's a little, bervo a little more verbose than the YAML format, but it's a little easier to do um, like code inspections and things like that on it. Uh, so here's the same definition for the same things. Um, here you have an arg uh, for important service, you see argument type service ID logger factory. This just points back to um, the first service uh, whose ID is file logger. Same way of interfacing with the container, you can either uh, ask for it to be passed by dependency injection, or if you need to get it directly from the container, you can ask for it by name. Uh, has anyone used Pimple? Pimple's a lightweight PHP uh, container. Uh, it's actually the, um, the uh, dependency injection component used by Silex. Uh, so if you're a Silex user and you didn't realize you were using Pimple, now you know you were using Pimple. Um, it's a PHP configuration. Um, so here we're actually defining a pimple container, um, and then we're using array access overloads to, to name services 
uh, like file logger, and then just passing it in a function, which is a uh, factory to create that object. So it works exactly the same way um, that you would expect. Um, it's just that you're manually writing PHP to do this, and PHP is being run every time uh, to do these things. If you look at important service, um, you can have the factory accept the container itself. Um, so we're explicitly saying uh, return new important service, and then we're asking the container for logger factory. Um, the Laravel container was originally uh, pimple-based, I think, uh, but now it's uh, its own implementation. Um, it's somewhat similar to pimple in the way that it's a PHP-driven configuration. Uh, so you create your container, but rather than just using like a ray access or something simple, uh, you actually have things like singleton method where you can say, uh, create a singleton container, uh, container service, call it file logger, and then you can be passed um, the container into uh, the, the factory method. So it's pretty similar to the way that the Silex one works, just you're using a method instead of doing direct array access. Um, but one of the things that I noticed when I started playing with Laravel um, and actually looking at other people's code samples is that they did something really cool. Um, they started to do uh, service IDs as class names. So um, the this difference is pretty minimal. It's just that you can ask for um, important service by class name, and then it would get everything for you. Um, so this turned out to be like really awesome. I really enjoyed using this um, because one of the things that um, I hadn't really realized bothered me about doing like Symphony style containers is coming up with an ID was annoying. Um, having to actually figure out what these names are, especially if you know you're namespacing them with dots to be consistent. You decide you want to change it, then you have to go change your whole application because now you want something different. Um, it, it just seemed very tiresome and pointless for the most part to me. Um, so I really liked this quite a bit. And then I, um, if you look back at what I had originally done with something like re um, Substrate, uh, if you're using class names, suddenly you can get really interesting. Uh, because if we're looking through all the constructor parameters, if we find an object that's already defined, um, we could use that. Um, but the other thing we could do is say, if it wasn't found, make it. So if the ID is actually a class name, it will just instantiate that object using the dependency injection container, which means that it can create new objects and it doesn't need to know about them. So if we look at the, um, the uh, Laravel container example, if we know how to make, um, if the uh, object knows how to make important service, and knows that a logger factory exists as a class, then it should just be able to make that on its own. So we don't actually need to define it because its only dependency is something that's a class, so it can just do that. Same thing for the logger factory itself. It only needs to know how to make a file logger. And since it's a dependency injection container, if we can assume that it can automatically instantiate that, then we should be good to go. So really, all we need to do is look at um, the file logger class because the file logger class is different. File logger uh, requires a path to a file name. And that's not something that it can just guess on its own. It's not gonna be able to go try to create a new file name. Uh, that doesn't work. So this is where we get stuck with this. So you can follow this chain down, at removing de um, definitions until you get to this part. And that's where we come to this notion of binding primitives. What binding primitives does is allow you to specify when, uh, within a certain context, if a certain value is required, where do you get it from? So what you would do in the Laravel container world is you would create the container, and the only thing we need to specify in order for this example to work is that when the file logger class needs the file name argument, give it this value, and then everything works. We don't have to do anything else. We don't have to configure any of the other classes in the container anymore. And this is really what, what auto-wiring is about. Um, it's about being able to uh, determine which object graph to create uh, with as little configuration as possible. And where this is really nice is when you're changing your application. Um, if you want to change your application in trivial ways, um, most of the time you don't have to do any changes at all. So if we look at, say, important service, we're gonna extend this now. Um, what we had originally was just one collaborator, 
uh, logger factory, and it just did something, it, and then it logged. Uh, we're going to add a new class. We're going to add a connection class, and this connection class is going to have an execute method. And we're going to extend the important service class to now take the connection as another, depend, uh, another constructor argument, and then inside do important task, we're actually going to execute uh, something on the connection before we do the logging. So if we go back now to the k.php implementation to just, you know, test this out, uh, we're going to change the way that our objects are created. Uh, we're still creating the file logger, we're still creating the logger factory, but now we're creating the connection, and then we're passing the connection to the logger factory. Uh, if we look at the services YAML file from uh, Symfony format, uh, what we need to do is add the connection class, and we need to um, specify which class it's going to be, and then we need to specify uh, an additional argument for connection. Uh, we have to do all those same things if we had an XML configuration instead. Um, <laughs> Pimple container uh, starts to get a little more, it, it, gets, it gets a little bigger. Um, you still have to create the connection class um, and you have to pass it into the important service. So basically every time you add a new dependency with any of the manual wiring, um, you have to actually go into the, to your configuration before anything will work. Um, in the Laravel example, uh, if we had made this change, we wouldn't have to do anything to our configuration because the container knows how to create the important service uh, because it takes a connection and it knows how to make a connection. So it doesn't need to do anything else. Uh, so this really, really speeds up development um, by not having to worry about manually wiring everything up before you can start using your code. And this is something that I, I think I realized at some point last year that one of the big reasons that I started to struggle with working with Symfony uh, was that I, was, I became resistant to change. Uh, I didn't want to have to change my code because that would require me to go dive into my conf configuration files and in some cases change, you know, hundreds of lines of code because I added an, a new dependency to a class that I had, you know, a bunch of instances of. Um, I would try to find ways to avoid actually adding dependencies and trying to find ways to avoid going into work with my configuration. So the pros of auto wiring, um, I think it's an amazing developer experience. Um, it just works for like 98% of the classes that you build. Um, and I think that's, that's awesome <laughs> because it really cuts down on the amount of boilerplate, on the amount of configuration overhead, uh, just to um, do something that PHP can figure out for you. Uh, it's pretty nice. Um, it's great for uh, heavy refactoring sessions. So if you're looking at your code and you really want to change the way things work, um, you don't have to worry about also changing the configuration. Um, there's so many times where I would go in and change one dependency and then I would find out I have to change like five more. Um, or worse, you all of a sudden require one new dependency and realize you have to wire up like 13 dependencies for that object. So you just wanted this one, now you have to you know, spend three hours trying to make sure that new object is wired up correctly. Uh, it really makes uh, refactoring sessions go a lot more quickly. Um, ultimately, it comes down to writing more code and less configuration. Uh, so auto wiring can really help you out a lot there. And another pro is it feels like magic. Um, if you really start using it and enjoy it, um, it feels really, really great. There are some cons, uh, so it's not all, all good. Um, in general, the idea of auto wiring um, will probably cause performance issues depending on the framework you're using, um, especially if you're doing anything that's resolving this stuff at runtime. Um, it can be difficult to optimize. Um, because you don't have as much control. I mean, it's the whole point of inversion of control is you're turning over that control to something else. Um, so if there's you know, performance issues within the container itself um, and you're not actually configuring the container, you, there's not a whole lot you can do about it. And of course, magic is also a con for many, many, many people. <laughs> um, so if we want to look at the future um, of, of auto wiring, it's, it's, I sort of feel like it's here. Um, the best of both worlds for me uh, would be Symfony and auto wiring uh, because Symfony has the compiled container that doesn't give you runtime uh, performance problems. Um, it'll just work. It'll be fast and it's done at build time and it either works or it doesn't and you can fix it. Um, but also having access to auto wiring to improve de developer experience. 
So I was really excited when Symphony 2.8 dropped and it had service auto wiring. And um, I was super excited because I wanted to see what this would look like because I thought this would help a lot. Uh, so the, the original implementation of, of service auto wiring um, in Symphony was that what you could do is take a definition like this and if service one um, could be a private uh, service, uh, you could just set auto wire true on service two. And then you wouldn't have to define service one. But you still had to define service two, which sort of really didn't save a lot. I didn't want to have to go in and put auto wire on 50 classes because I wanted those to be auto wired too. Uh, so I very much felt like, what's the point? I got kind of bummed and I didn't really uh, look at it very hard. Uh, but fortunately, other people did. Uh, so there's a lot of really cool things that happened uh, once auto wiring was available. Uh, there was an auto wiring bundle that allowed you to um, actually omit the auto wire. So, you know, it's a Baby step, <laughs> um, but you know it, it was getting there. It, it was getting to the point where you know you're writing less code, um, and then there was a uh, action bundle that was actually really super cool. Uh, what it did was it scanned directories for classes, and then generated uh, those services um, on its own um, and using class names as the ID. So now we're really getting to a point where things can be more interesting. Um, so what this allowed uh, people to do was to write a home page controller like this where the constructor could ask for you know, the router interface and the twig environment and it would just be injected automatically. So you wouldn't actually have to do anything uh, for this to work. Uh, the cool thing was that really the underlying technology here had nothing to do with controllers. It was more, um, it was more about uh, uh, any class that could be scanned. So it would actually be able to find any class, look at it, and figure out uh, what was going on. So this gave us the opportunity then to really build on that and get the performance, get the optimization, and also improve the developer experience. We were able to start, at least with this bundle, creating controllers that required no configuration at all um, and still being able to inject everything. And then Symphony 3.3 came out, and Symphony 3.3 really changed the way that uh, Symphony was doing auto wiring. Uh, there was a patch that was added to uh, let you specify an optional class um, for class name services. So you no longer had to actually specify an, uh, a class if you could assume the, the class name was a, was a um, if you could assume the class name was going to be the ID. So here, uh, if the service, if you previously would have named it vendor namespace class, you'd have to still specify the class name. Uh, after this patch was put into place, um, you could just put in the um, vendor namespace class as the service ID, and that was it. So this, this already trimmed uh, quite a bit of um, extra configuration that was sort of redundant. Um, there was also um, some work put into place to allow you to uh, create defaults for the entire service, for, that, or for that, the entire bundle. So this allowed you to do things like uh, globally set public tags and auto wiring for the whole package, regardless of how many classes were in them. Uh, so if before you had a foo class and a bar class and both were public false and auto wire true, you know, having to do that every single class you were adding um, wasn't super nice. Uh, now you'd be able to specify defaults, public false, auto wire true. Um, you know, this example looks really not super nice, but if you can imagine having you know, 30, or 30 to 50 classes within this uh, service file, um, You've just saved a ton of time. You've saved a ton of uh, configuration work that you'd have to do. Um, the other really nice thing was kind of bringing the action bundle into core, uh, giving you the ability to do PSR4 based discovery and registration. Uh, PS4 was the auto loading standard um, that uh, that Composer uses by default now. It's, it uh, superseded. Um, uh, PSR0, and what it allows you to do is specify a namespace root, um, and then it would actually be able to scan those directories. So, for example, you could say um, this, for the services, anything in the app namespace, um, you would look in dot dot slash source, and so that would assume that all of those um, classes from that point on uh, had an app prefix, and then you could look in the controllers directory and you can look in the command directory. So, what this would do um, is specify any controller, any command within the source directory um, would be auto-wired by default. So you've now removed the need to do any sort of uh, manual configuration for controllers or commands. 
If they're in that directory, they just work. They're already in the container. The, the <laughs> there was another feature that was kind of cool that probably doesn't make a lot of sense if you're not super familiar with Symfony. Um, local interface defined configs. Uh, what this allowed you to do was to specify if things were an instance of a class or an interface to then apply rules to those. Uh, so for example, here we have a command. Anything that was an instance of the Symfony console command command class uh, would automatically get the console.tag command. Um, it will also be set to public, uh, public true. Twig extensions, anything that extended the, the Twig extension interface would um, automatically be tagged with Twig extension. Uh, so this, this was kind of nice because if you had a whole bunch of things that, say you had 15 Twig extensions, uh, you wouldn't have to define any of them anymore. Uh, be before, you would have had to define them uh, regardless of auto wiring because you would needed to have put the uh, twig.extension tag on them. This, this makes it so you wouldn't have to do that anymore. And this was shortly followed after by automatic instance of. So uh, what this meant was that um, after, um, after a bunch of work had been done to do this sort of instance of um, bit, we made it so, uh, our symphony made it so that those were just added automatically. So whereas before we would have had to say instance of uh, event subscriber interface, give it a tag, um, what we could do after that was just require uh, uh, the check requirement subscriber. And those checks before um, are just built in now. So if you build your own uh, compiler passes and do interesting things with tags um, and you uh, are able to get your uh, package installed in such a way that it automatically adds these things. When people add classes that match whatever your compiler passes are doing, they'll just automatically be brought in and configured correctly. So this, this too cleaned up a lot of the boilerplate that was in the Symfony uh, service configuration before. Um, and then named arguments. Named arguments uh, were sort of the solution for um, Binding, uh, binding primitives. So if you had something like a newsletter manager uh, that required a logger interface and an entity and an API key, all of a sudden this traditionally wouldn't have been able to be auto-wired by Symfony. Um, but now there's two ways that you can actually specify this. You can do the more traditional syntax. Um, there's now the arguments where you can say dollar API key colon mandrel API key, um, or you can use it uh, with the, the new short syntax where you can just say API key, Mandrel API key, and then the other arguments that are classes can actually be resolved using auto wiring. So it really cleans things up quite a bit. There was also something cool that was done that was sort of feels like auto wiring um, that does the same thing for controller arguments. Um, so whereas before maybe you would try to put all of your dependency injection um, in the constructor, uh, to say like everything needs twig, so I'm gonna put twig in the constructor. But maybe only one of the actions of like 30 actions within that controller actually used twig. Uh, what you can do now is specify the dependency uh, in, the, in the method itself and it'll get that out of the container. So when it gets here to the my action, it's gonna say, okay, I know the request, um, I'm gonna have to get the router and I'm gonna have to get twig and it just gets passed to you. So this, is, this falls more in line with dependency inversion where you don't know where that's coming from. Um, the, the inversion control concept of something else is doing this um, and it's using the container to sort of help out in that case. So this all sort of came together really nicely with Symfony Flex. Uh, Symfony Flex default service configuration file now looks like this. Um, if you aren't familiar with, with uh, Symfony uh, bundles in the past, um, it was a little more complicated than this. But what this is saying is that anything in the source directory for command, form, event subscriber, twig, and voter, um, those are all gonna be scanned automatically. So those will all be um, uh, candidates for auto wiring. Um, and specifically the controller, uh, the controller adds on to app. It looks in source controller, it sets the default to true for public, and then it adds the controller service arguments. So any of the controllers are automatically um, going to be able to access this service argument thing that will, um, this, this thing here where it gets specified twig as a dependency for the, the, the action. Um, that's actually uh, not enabled by default, but you can enable it across all your controllers by adding uh, the service arguments tag. Uh, 
So this is all fine and good. Um, looking at uh, a real Symphony 4 slash Symphony Flex application, um, I have a prototype application I've been working on. Um, I have a controller uh, that has, uh, or I have a controller directory that has a bunch of controllers. Uh, some of the controllers are, um, they don't have any real dependency injection. Um, this one's using um, the service arguments, so it's getting the authentication utils object passed to it when it's called. That, that's just coming straight from the container. Um, this controller is a little more complicated. This is actually getting um, a server factory and OAuth repository passed in uh, as constructor arguments. So that's using dependency injection for all of the functions within, the, within this controller. Uh, but the connect method itself also takes in session interface and a business. Uh, it's getting business um, from the URL. Uh, it's, it's a param converter. Um, and then it's getting the uh, session just from the container. So it's, it's kind of doing a bunch of things uh, to get this uh, working correctly. I have a special doctrine listener that does something because doctrine and Postgres were not working quite, quite right. Uh, there's a couple of event subscribers. Um, there's some custom code that doesn't have anything to do with Symfony, doesn't have anything to do with doctrine um, for integrating with Etsy. Um, there's uh, some validators that were created. Um, this validator is using the, the business repository, so it's using standard dependency injection. Um, altogether, there's about 49 classes that are in this application so far that are in the source directory that are directly related to the class, um, or to the, the project. If we look at uh, Symphony 4's uh, Flex's default service configuration, uh, the only thing that I switched um, up here was that I decided to require everything in dot dot slash source instead of uh, whitelisting directories. Um, instead, I decided to exclude directories. So I'm excluding entity migrations, tests, and kernel. So from the default configuration, I didn't change a whole lot. Um, and then the entirety of the rest of the configuration that I did for this project is this page. Um, I had to specify some named arguments for the, um, uh, for the primitive bindings for some, a uh, bunch of keys and secrets. So uh, I needed the Etsy OAuth key and secret. I needed the uh, Etsy OAuth, uh, it's using the same uh, arguments actually. And then there's the uh, Twitter consumer key and uh, consumer secret. So this, this was all I've done. And I've gotten all of the other objects passed to me either in a controller using the, the command services or they were passed to me by dependency injection. Um, all of these things were automatically configured correctly, so the security voters, uh, the controllers act as controllers, everything. I didn't have to do anything to my services configuration except this to get all of my 49 files uh, set up so that I could just get them directly from the container. So I think it's a huge win. Um, I really think that we get the, the best of both worlds in this. The developer experience on it was extraordinary. Uh, I was like never, <laughs> I've never worked with a Symfony app like this where I didn't get really bogged down with, you know, having to go into do configuration and do I really want to make this change because then I'm going to have to make these, these changes over here. Didn't have any of that. It was great. Um, and in development it works great because it does this all at runtime. Uh, but when I actually deploy this application on Heroku, at, at build time it creates that container. And at build time, it runs as fast as it would if, as if I weren't using auto wiring. So there really aren't a lot of cons to this. Uh, but if you're still not con convinced, I'd say give it a try. Uh, especially um, either use Laravel or use uh, Symphony 4 Flex, just to kind of get an idea of, of how it feels. Um, if you're really worried, just remember that up, configuration ends up being more of an exception than something that you need to do up front. Um, Again, I only had a couple of places where I had to do anything at all uh, with my configuration. Uh, you can always wire manually if something breaks. Um, that's one of the key things within Symfony. They're, they're very much about um, making these things optional. If you still want to completely wire up 90% of your application, but some little tiny bit you think is simple enough that auto wiring is fine, you can do that. It's on, a, it's on a package by package basis. So if you have five service configuration files for five different pieces of your application, you can cho choose to do just one as auto-wiring and see how it feels. So definitely I'd say give it a try. 
Um, and that's it. Thank you, Bo. Are there any questions for, for Bo? Okay. One moment. Okay. Working? Yeah. Uh, so if, if I don't use Symfony, mm -hmm. and I insist on type hit, hinting to an interface instead of a solid class, mm, do you know any practice or a tip how to like resolve a class from the interface? Because interface doesn't have a constructor to analyze. Right. So you cannot reflect on interface. Right. So um, it's a great question. Um, actually, I have more slides, and that's the one that people usually ask about. Um, and there, you, the, what you're talking about is interface binding, I believe. Uh, so the idea being that if we had the logger factory um, and we wanted file logger to actually be an implementation of a logger interface, uh, we could change that code. Um, and then um, what we had before was um, this wouldn't work, this would break, because now file logger is going to be it's, it's not anywhere, but it's trying to look for, for a logger now. So this would actually break. Um, so what we would need to do in that case after that refactoring would be to say bind logger.class or logger class to file logger. And so this means now the container will resolve anytime someone's looking for a logger, pass it the file logger. Um, if you want to be specific, so for example, maybe you want to say globally, any time, you know, give me a syslogger. Um, you could do that. Um, um, that uh, gets into contextual binding. So this is usually the second question people will ask about that if interfaces are great, but if I have multiple implementations. Um, if we had a null logger, uh, we could create an unimportant service and say now null logger um, gets passed to the unimportant service um, and then the important service gets the file logger. So that is how you would do that with manual wiring. If you want to do that with um, something like auto wiring, what you could do um, it becomes a little more complicated because now you have to do uh, one extra line where you can say bind file logger to logger. So by default, anything that wants a logger is going to get a file logger. But when an important service needs logger factory, uh, give it a uh, null logger that was, uh, or give it a file fa uh, logger factory that was created with a null logger. So yep. Right. So you, you need to specify which one you want uh, for specific services, um, or you can define it globally, uh, which is the case with like caches sometimes, or like a log logging is actually a really good example where. Maybe you use monologue 90% of the time, but sometimes you want to bypass monologue because it's too heavy and you just want to do something really quick to syslog or something. Um, you could specify that, that monologue is the default handler. So anytime you want a PSR4 logger, use monologue. But when this class wants it, give it something else. So th there, there are ways around that. Is that what you were asking? Okay. Yep. Yep. You have to tell it, and that's and that's where you know people get really nervous about auto wiring because of oh what if it doesn't get the right one and it won't work. <laughs> and the, the, well, good ones, uh, good dependency injection containers won't work because it finds that problem. It says I don't have any loggers, or I have two instances of them, and I don't you, I don't know which one to use. So. Um, yeah, so the pe people who worry about that, the container doesn't do it for you. It actually requires you to manually wire it in those cases. Uh, so it, it seems scary until you've tried it and realize, one, it doesn't happen often. <laughs> like I, I, like I didn't, it didn't run into it in my application. And two, when it does happen, it's, it's, there, there's ways around it that make it work and make it explicit and you're very clear in your configuration what's going on. Okay, gentlemen over here. I, uh, I noticed in your Symfony Flex slide that mm -hmm. you have uh, services private as default. Can you elaborate why Symfony 4 has private services as, the, as default? So um, the way I understand it is that those are sort of like uh, 
it's the same thing as like private dependencies. If there are, um, if there's no reason for anybody to need that object, then it doesn't need to clutter the, the whole global scope so that uh, when you look up services, um, you don't have to look at the whole namespace of every single service defined. You only look for the, you only get to select from the ones that are, um, that are public that you can actually get named. Let me see if I can pull that slide up. This one? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, so um, I think there's also some sub-container stuff that you can do now where you can actually get a service locator from the dependency injection container. So let's say I want to get a service locator that only contains um, Twig extensions. You can do that now. So you can ask for a service locator that only contains Twig extensions. Um, so then the top level keys of that service locator are only going to have the actual extensions, but they might have dependencies that you don't need, you don't need to know about them. Um, so if you do a container dump on that service locator, it does, none of those matter uh, because what you're really interested in is the top level services. So I don't know if that's, yeah. the, the, that's slightly off topic. <laughs> yeah, no. yeah. What, what, what I was fishing for is uh, private services are removed when the containers containers compiled. Oh, okay. So th that, that's why you don't have any performance issues with including so many services in your container. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, I didn't know that, so. Your answer was also very interesting. <laughs> cool. Are there, is there more questions? Is there time for more? Some more questions? No, you can always ask a uh, question uh, in the middle track. Mm -hmm. if, you, if it's okay with you, yep. of course. Okay, then I'm I, gonna. I have uh, I have one question. Oh, it's okay. How many people are now more interested in trying uh, auto wiring than before? Cool. <laughs> at, le at least at least half of the people will will maybe try. That's awesome. <laughs> cool. Okay. Uh, thank you for uh, coming. Uh, this concludes our first day. And just before I tell you to see you tomorrow, I'm gonna ask you to. Join me in the middle track, and finally, you were talking about logger, mm. and I, all the time I hit logger in my head, you know. So if you want to join me, join me to a couple of uh, beers, perhaps, and uh, just uh, have fun. Thank you. See you tomorrow.